The second talk entitled From Basic Science to the Battlefield of COVID-19 will be delivered by Andrea Gamarnik from the Instituto de Investigaciones Bioquímicas, Fundación Instituto Leluar, Buenos Aires. Andrea graduated as a biochemist from the University of Buenos Aires School of Pharmacy and Biochemistry and obtained a PhD from the same university. She then moved to the US for a postdoc at UCSF specializing in virology where she discovered molecular mechanisms underlying the replication of the polio virus. Still being in the US, she moved to industry to develop phenotypic assays for HIV and hepatitis B and C. In 2001, Andrea was brave enough to return to Argentina to establish her own molecular virology lab within Fundación Instituto Leluar as a research scientist of the Argentine National Research Council. Since then, she has made groundbreaking discoveries concerning the replication of uh, the dengue and Zika viruses. The caliber of her work has been distinguished with, with several awards, and this include being member of the American Academy of Microbiology, being named International Scholar of the Howard Hughes Medical Institute, and being granted the award Laureate for Latin America from the L'Oreal UNESCO for Women in Science program. With the outbreak of the COVID-19 pandemic, Andrea did not doubt and shifted her entire virology lab to serve the Argentine health system. In the midst of the country lockdown due to the pandemic, her lab worked day and night in order to develop a serologic test that could detect immunoglobin G and they were successful in obtaining a highly specific one in only 40 days. This serologic test is the one now being used in our country, Argentina. So, hello, uh, good morning. Uh, first, I would like to thank uh, for the opportunity to share our work with us. We are a laboratory that does a basic uh, molecular virology work, but today I'm going to give you also uh, information about the work that we are currently doing uh, during the, the, the emergency, the COVID-19 emergency. So uh, in my lab, we work mainly with two viruses, with dengue and Zika. These are two very important human pathogens. Uh, there are, um, the dengue in particular is the most important human viral disease transmitted by mosquitoes around the world. And in Latin America, we experience uh, big, uh, large uh, epidemics every year. And actually, the last season, 2019-2020, uh, we had the, the record number of, of cases that were above 3 million. And Argentina experienced in 2020, this year, also uh, the world's outbreak in history, which overlap with the COVID-19. Regarding Zika, Zika is an emerging virus uh, also belongs to the same group of dengue. It's mainly transmitted by mosquitoes. And uh, we um, uh, had to face a few years ago a large uh, epidemic of, of Zika. Uh, Zika is a, a, was a new virus, so we knew very little about the transmission, about the pathogenesis, and uh, it was a huge problem in Latin America. Especially women, we are uh, we are very, very uh, vulnerable because uh, the, the virus was uh, sexually transmitted and also caused, caused uh, birth neurological disorders. Uh, so this was a, a, a particularly a burden for women in, in poor areas that did not have access to birth control and were facing really hard um, laws against abortion. So it was a huge problem, not only a scientific problem, but a social problem. So in our work, in, in our lab, we're working with these two viruses that are RNA viruses. And uh, what we do in our lab is to study uh, the function of the viral RNA. So how these RNA structures 
this is a representation of the viral genome, the viral genome, how these RNA structures function during the viral replication, and what are the mechanisms of action of these viruses. So Deng and Zika belong to this large group of uh, flaviviruses that are transmitted by insects, uh, by mosquitoes uh, to humans, and also by ticks. And uh, they are uh, important viruses that are emerging and re-emerging, and uh, uh, they are a, a huge threat for, for uh, human health. Uh, uh, there are also uh, flaviviruses that infect only insects. And one of the things that we are very interested in my lab is to study what does it take for a virus to jump from the mosquito to human. So these viruses, like dengue, they naturally cycle between human and mosquitoes and other animals. But what happens with these viruses that are only in mosquitoes or only in mammalia cells? So we are studying uh, what does it take to break that uh, barrier to go from one species to the other? And working with dengue, uh, what we found a few years ago is that if we look at the viral population that replicates in mosquitoes, it's different than the population that is in, in human cells. And if we go back and forth and we make the virus to, to cycle from one to the other, we see that this population changes. And what we found is an RNA structure in the viral genome that also follows these cycles of disruption and reconstitution. So the RNA uh, breaks and makes these uh, uh, different structures. And when it goes back to humans, it's reconstituted. So what we found is that these RNA structures play different functions in the two hosts. So we identify a new mechanism of host adaptation by a specialization of this RNA element. And the, the newest work that we are doing currently in the lab, actually the, this work was published a few days ago, so if somebody is interested can go and, and see details. I'm only going to give you the flavor of what we were doing until recently in my lab. So in this work, we use a Zika virus, and we found that deletion of a specific regions of the three prime UTR of this virus uh, restricted replication to only mosquitoes. So this virus was able to infect and replicate in mosquito cells and also in mosquitoes and reach the salivary glands of the mosquitoes. That is a, a measurement of how uh, the, the, the virus can be transmitted. And uh, on the other hand, this virus was incapable of replicating in human cells. So it replicated uh, well in mosquitoes, but was completely impaired in human cells. So what we found, to make a long story short, is that this virus um, is unable to counteract the human innate antiviral response. So specifically, it uh, cannot uh, uh, control the uh, interference uh, signaling, something that uh, in, in the mosquito doesn't exist. So, so this virus has to deal with two different immune systems and requires different elements and different processes to be able to succeed in both hosts. And we found an element that is important to counteract the human antiviral response, but not the mosquito. So this work was done at the end of February, but a uh, few days after we submitted the paper and a few days after uh, uh, the lab was shut down. Um, uh, the first case of COVID-19 uh, in Argentina was March 3rd. So uh, uh, the government took very quick measurements and, and uh, controlled the circulation uh, in, in, in the country and the schools, the universities, the research institutes were shut down. And by March uh, uh, 19th, Argentina entered in a nationwide lockdown that was very strict. But at the same time, the Ministry of Science recruited investigators from different places of the country to create this uh, task force that uh, was called Coronavirus Unit. So 
So my lab was recruited for this work, and uh, we had a, as a goal to develop and produce a serologic test uh, to detect antibodies against uh, the new coronavirus. So for that, we produced these uh, ELISA, ELISA assays. Uh, we had these plates to detect specific antibodies against coronavirus, and we had to decide which proteins we use. And uh, there are two proteins, the nuclear protein and the, the the spike lycoprotein, this is the representation of the virion that now everybody knows very well. So these two proteins are used to, to, to detect antibodies. We express both proteins, we express uh, different domains of these proteins and study sensibility, specificity. Uh, and we decided to work with the spike uh, protein and the receptor binding domain that is this part that is green here uh, that is the domain that uh, binds to the receptor during viral entry. And we decided to use these two proteins and code uh, the plate with these two proteins because uh, uh, the assay was much better, but they were a pain because they are heavily glycosylated. They have to be expressed in human cells and the yield, the amount of protein that we produce is, uh, is very low. However, we went through this uh, uh, rough road because we have to produce large amounts of proteins to produce precisely thousands of these plates. Uh, but we work uh, very hard, uh, uh, 15 hours a day, seven days a week. And in short time, we came up with this prototype kit that was optimized and validated. We sent it out for external validation as well. And by uh, May 4th, we had approval from the national administration uh, that is similar to the, to the FDA, but in Argentina. And uh, uh, we already distributed 80,000 tests of this kit uh, free uh, for hospitals and health centers, private and public of the whole country. And currently we are, uh, um, uh, we have the capacity to produce about uh, 100,000 tests a week. And this was thanks to the, the association with the Lemos Laboratory that has great experience to produce a, a LISA kit for Chagas disease and help us to, to really put this, this project forward. So my lab became a factory to produce, uh, to produce the proteins for this kit and also to, to validate and work in the production of the kit. Uh, but also uh, we engage in a number of collaborations and projects uh, uh, with different institutions. So we measure IgG and IgM levels to monitor hospitalized patients. This uh, is being done also in my lab. Uh, we engage in, in collaborations uh, uh, to do seroprevalence style in different populations. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about one of our experiences with a, a one slum in the city of Buenos Aires. We work with uh, convalescent plasma uh, 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 for therapies. So uh, everybody knows that uh, the, the plasma from people that uh, have had uh, the, the infection can be used for therapy. So in my lab, we are helping uh, at least three multicenter studies uh, doing the ICC titers and also neutralization assay. And we are also helping in evaluate the, the, the status, the immune status of health uh, professionals. So I'm going to uh, show you briefly what we learned about the antibody response with the new coronavirus. If we see the antibody, antibody, uh, antibody response for dengue, we see that there is a viremia and there is a response, early response of IgM, and then later there is the IgG uh, response. What we learn uh, with, the, with the new coronavirus is that here is the viral RNA that is detected in the swabs, and IgM and IgG appears almost at the same time. And this was quite striking at the beginning. And uh, also the early detection in this part of the IgG, it coexists 
with, the, with viral detection. This means that uh, in this part, we can detect IgG of people that are still shedding viruses and can be infection, infected. So also we can be in this part of the core and detect the IgG and uh, the people already saw the infection. So we can detect people that have been infected or people that are currently infected. So we process in my lab uh, thousands of samples. Here I show you a plot where we see the, the pattern of IgG and IgM of 1,500 samples. But what we learn is that the zero conversion of IgG can be very early. These are 20 patients that I just plot here to show you with more detail. But there are many patients that have this zero conversion very early in the, in the first week. But there are patients that show the same thing after two weeks or even three weeks. So it's very variable according to the patients. So regarding to the study of seroprevalence, uh, I'm going to share with you our experience with uh, one of the, the, the largest uh, slums of the city of Buenos Aires, that is the Barrio pa uh, Padre Mujica. And this uh, neighborhood uh, is one of the most crowded uh, slums in the city with more than 40,000 inhabitants and around 1,500 people uh, experiencing homelessness inside the, the, the slum. Uh, in most of the cases, the households uh, have uh, scarce water and sanitation, and the space constraints make this uh, uh, physical distancing and self-quarantine impractical. So this is really uh, a problem for the spread of the virus. Uh, this work was uh, led by a, a uh, epidemiologist, uh, Silvana Figar, who really put together a, a community-based study. And uh, the first problem that we ran in this, uh, in this uh, project was that it was impossible to go out and get uh, and draw blood from the arm uh, to 100 and 1,000 people at, at the door of houses. So, so it was impossible to do the ELISAs uh, taking the, the, the plasma or serum in the, in the neighborhood and taking it to the lab. So what we implemented is a new tool to perform this ELISA assay by using a finger prick blood sample. And uh, people in my lab very quickly were able to, to optimize and to um, uh, validate the ELISA kit to use a whole blood, just a drop from the finger. And so we came up with this uh, zero kit that is a self-contained kit that uh, is used by the health uh, worker or the nurses to go to the street and, and get the samples to go back to the lab then to process the LISA. So people in my lab did a, a great job very quickly and we used these tools that were previously used for, for uh, zero prevalence studies of Chagas disease and we apply it to, to coronavirus. So uh, in this study, uh, 873 people were already tested. The study finished recently, and the preliminary results uh, indicated a very high prevalence of 53% of people with IgG positive. These numbers are really unprecedented, are uh, extremely high prevalence uh, due to the, 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 the poor conditions of the people in the slum. And this is in agreement with the recent evidence that COVID-19 has disproportionately affected marginalized uh, populations. And as a matter of fact, a few, uh, few days ago, there was an article in the New York Times where in Queens, uh, there was um, a, a zero prevalence study also in vulnerable neighborhoods where uh, the, the, the prevalence reached uh, uh, over, actually, it was more than 60%. So this uh, uh, was uh, 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 an, an outstanding experience for us. So I want to, to finish uh, uh, acknowledging the people that are after, uh, behind all this. Uh, all this work was done in, in less than three months, and all the people in my lab participated in this, in this uh, uh, huge uh, collaborative project. 
Uh, also, I would like to acknowledge the people from the LEMOS laboratory and other people from the Institut de Loire that collaborated and are, are actually part of the, the, the team. And the, the, the people from the seroprevalence study, Dr. Uh, uh, Silvana Figar, that is an uh, epidemiologist and the person that is doing the clinical work, Alicia Mitchenko. And also, I would like to thank the, 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 our friends from the Mount Sinai, Florian Kramer, that helped us a lot, a lot to initiate with the LISA uh, test, and Ben Hurley, that uh, also contributed uh, to, to the um, neutralization assays that we are doing with convalescent uh, samples. And Anna Sesma, who is uh, uh, helping us uh, throughout the whole, this whole process. So thank you very much, and I will be happy to take questions. Andrea, thank you so much. Um, that was a very impressive talk. Um, I think that um, the fact that your lab was able to shift so quickly into somewhat of a factory mode um, to produce this assay is, is very impressive. And uh, especially that the assay was developed, um, you know, in about 40 days. Um, so quickly, can you just, uh, we do have a few audience questions, but can you just start by telling us a little bit about sort of the culture or the environment at Le Loire or even within your own lab that really sort of supported this, this um, like very fast transition? Yes, it was a, a really, a, a, for, for me and for all the people, it was really an outstanding uh, experience. And one thing that probably people around the world don't know is that in Argentina, we have to import all the reagents and all the, the tools to, to do the work. And when we started with this, we ran into this uh, huge problem because we, we didn't have many of the reagents. And going to your question, we found a, a great solidarity and all the institute and people outside the institute help us really to move forward with this, this project. The lab is the, 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 my lab is the only one working in the whole institute. So the, the institute is completely shut down. Only the people that go to do the essential things go to the, the institute. But we got help really from everybody. And, and within the group that, that is participating in this, uh, in this amazing project, uh, we, we, we got the best of everybody. I think that this pandemia or this pandemic, sorry, uh, really put out the best of, of each of us to move towards the, the, the common goal that right. was to help the, the Ministry of, of Health and, and to help the, right. the, the society. Great. So I'm going to, we're running out of time here, but I'm going to read a few of the, um, the audience questions. Um, one from Eric Zhao is, um, it's very intriguing that um, for SARS-CoV-2, both IgM and IgG seem to be induced almost simultaneously. Do you have any speculations on um, why this might be the case? So we, we uh, when we saw that, we, we ran, as I mentioned, thousands of, of, um, of samples and we saw that over and over. And in some cases we see IgG before, even one or two days before IgM. I mean, for us was really striking. One possibility is that the, the sensitivity, to, to, the sensitivity to, to detect IgG is higher because the affinity of the antibody for the antigen is higher. So we, we can detect IgG better than IgM. So it could be a, a, a problem of that in, in, in one or two days difference, but really both appear appear really early and we don't know the, the reason, of course. We still don't know. I mean, there are so many questions that we will be addressing uh, with uh, w while we were walking through the pandemic. So um, with regard to the IgG seroconversion, since the rate was so different amongst all the patients, um, do you think this variability in um, timing might correlate with um, severity of, of symptoms or prognosis? Do you have any, you know, speculation on, on what that means individually yes. to the patients? Yes, we have, we have done some analysis regarding uh, asymptomatic or symptomatic people and even uh, 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 different levels of, of, of symptoms. And we see a correlation that the IgG levels are higher with, with, uh, with more symptoms. So that, that was, uh, was observed indeed. 
And do you have any evidence from longitudinal studies how long the IgG persists? That's a question from John. Well, we, we, are, we are currently working a lot in that regard. We are following patients. Now we have patients that went through this for 60 days, 70 days. And this is a, a, a great question and a great debate around the world of how long we have these antibodies and if the antibodies are protected or not. And we still don't know because in the time lapse that we are studying, um, 60 days, even up to 80 days, we didn't see decline of IgG. But there are some observations uh, uh, recently published this last week, actually. There is a paper, I think, that in Nature Medicine that suggests that in long times we see a decline of IgG. But this is actually the, one of the most important questions that we need to address. And how long does it last, this protection? Great. Thanks, Andrea. I think that's about all the time for questions that we have right now. But um, I do want to encourage um, everybody to head over to the Slack channel, especially if you had questions that were not um, answered. Both Andrea and Alberto promised me that they would head over and answer your questions. Um, there is a link in the chat box um, with an invitation. And I just want to end by thanking again very much our speakers for today, um, Alberto and Andrea. Um, your talks were excellent. We really enjoyed them, so thank you. Um, I want to thank the audience for joining us. I think we had um, at one point over um, 400 attendees, so that is excellent. Um, we also have um, a, another 3,000 or so joining on a secondary stream. Um, and I want to encourage everyone to come back next week at the same time, same link, um, to hear our next speakers. They are from the MRC LMB um, in Cambridge. And the speakers are Michelle Godere, Shores Shears, and Richard Henderson. So please join us next Wednesday for that. Thank you.